Okay, moving on to the basic area management and the vortex model. And a lot of this stuff is something that you already know. Um, you probably do it every day. And I'll just see if I can throw in a few tips and tricks for you guys and try to put it into the framework of, of the vortex model if you don't know about that. Um, there's a 10 minute video on the vortex model homepage to, to check that out. Um, and I hope to, I hope you, that you can get something out of this uh, part. Otherwise you can just skip it and go to the advanced area. Okay. So first of all, um, here's a quick model of how I see the vortex model to be used. You have your basic airway and then you have your, uh, to, if you have a patient with a problem, uh, if you have time point zero here and you have your time uh, to definite area here, then um, first of all, you almost always you have your um, basic area maneuvers, your positioning, your jaw thrust, chin lift, suction. Then you, ha you have what I might call your basic area plus maneuvers, which is doing something a bit more, um, which is your um, nasopharyngeal airway, your oropharyngeal airway, your um, back valve mask, and your NIV or CPAP, your BiPAP um, stuff. Um, and then you go into your vortex after that. You don't always have to do everything in sequence. Sometimes you have to jump right into um, what you would call your fauna, your um, um, your uh, your front of neck access, your uh, emergency uh, cricothyroidectomy, and. That's okay as well if the situation demands it. Usually you, you have to argue that this is a Kaiko um, situation. Um, but sometimes, as Rich Levitan talks about, you have a um, surgical inevitable airway, which would be maybe a severe trauma where you don't have any, you don't, you don't even want to attempt to uh, put a tube in. You can't put an LMA in and you can't oxygenate the patient, which you might try. Then you pretty quickly have this uh, situation, and because of opportunity cost during, like trying to to do any of the other things, might um, um, might be disadvantaged uh, for uh, be, might be a disadvantage for the patient. Then, well, then you sometimes you will just go directly to the um, uh, cutting the neck. So. You don't have to do it in the sequence. You don't have to do, do all of them. You can combine. You can mix and combine. And that's the thing with um, airway. Uh, you, you do the thing that is important in the situation. Sometimes it's doing the basic stuff. Sometimes it's doing the advanced stuff. And sometimes it's the combination. Here, down here, you can always think about doing a flexible fibroscopy um, and to get some more knowledge. Sometimes that has to be done with your anesthesiologist at, uh, or intubation um, uh, kit ready if they lose their airway. You always have to be you do your risk assessment and human factors and your planning. And that was what I just went through in the first part of this lecture, um, how to do that, uh, at least the risk assessment bit of it. Okay, so the vortex approach. Um, is mainly made up of these three elements. You have this vortex. Uh, if you look at this in 3D, it, this is like a cone. Um, and we right now we look at it from above. Um, there are three main airway um, management tools that can be used. There's the back valve mask, there's the, the LMA, the laryngeal, uh, uh, the um, suprachotic uh, or SGA, suprachotic airway. And there's the ETI, the um, intratracheal tubing, uh, intubation tube. Um, and the idea of this is that you can you can try this once, um, uh, an optimal attempt once, which an optimal attempt would be optimal according to all of these things, like optimal positioning, the best expert, so on, so on, and so forth. One attempt, one attempt at optimal uh, level, or uh, max uh, ma maximum of three attempts of a suboptimal sub attempt, but remember we always need to do the most optimal thing in the situation first. You don't don't just try. We have to do as if this is going to work. 
So almost always it's like one optimal attempt that didn't work, then we'll try one optimal attempt and then that didn't work and then we have to go to the last sort, which is this. Or depending on where you start, you can pick and choose which one is the best for the situation. So, uh, most often it will probably be this one first. Um, and then if that doesn't work, you will go to LMA uh, or BVM. But the thing is about this, one of the reasons why it's cone-shaped is, is that we will circle down the drain here for each attempt at each lifeline. We will circle down the drain, so you can't go back to that lifeline unless there's some kind of wildcard um, gained, like someone who's an expert of BVM suddenly comes along, or we fixed something in the patient that wasn't uh, wasn't fixable before, then we can do it now. If we don't, if we use up all our lifelines, then we'll go to Kaiko, which means that we have three optimal attempts before we go to Kaiko uh, or and and the Fona. Um, if we, however, do get to a stable situation, then we can go out to the green area. This is stable, or relative stability, where you can plan and you set a new plan, get some expert help, and do what you need to. So that's the vortex model, and all of this is like what you call adjuncts to the vortex model. I've made it like this, but I'll show you another way of seeing it in a, in a, a little layer, but this is how we'll go through it now. Um, the important thing about this vortex model being a um, you, you will progress through the, the stages is that, well, this is not a, um, this is a, so that you don't stay in the same, um, same stay in the same place as for too long because the the the, the person is desaturating. Um, as I said in part one, this is made par partly uh, out of the experiences that we gained from the alien Bromley case, uh, which can be found in the, on the Vortex uh, approach homepage. Uh, I should also say I don't get any money from the Vortex approach um, <laughs> or any sponsorship. Um, okay, well, let's go, go through all of these adjuncts that we need to be good at. Um, and let's start with the basic airway stuff here. So one of our lecturers um, told us this, and I think it's really, really um, good to think of, this like, think, think, of, think of it like this, especially for emergency physicians. Basic airway management is not the same thing as the, it being simple. These things are complex, these things can be difficult, but doing the simple stuff is often enough to make the patient better. So we need to be really good at this. So first of all, positioning. If you have your patient, one of the like most basic positions that we often um, might place patients in, especially usually the intoxicated patients where we want to like observe them with some kind of saturation and then we have to leave them because we don't have enough staff to be there all the time. Here we will do what we call the recovery position to reduce the respiration risk. Um, and as part of the recovery position, usually we will do what you call a chin lift um, to open their airway. So that's the basic positioning. For intubation and general airway management, you have to consider do, doing a 30 degrees though, like getting the patient at a 30 degrees angle so that their thorax, the weight of the thorax is not weighing down on their airway. And for intubation purposes especially, you want them to go into what you call sniffing position, um, which I will show you in a little while. Sniffing position is, uh, is um, it's flexion at the cervical spine, lower cervical spine, and it's extension at the atlanta occipital uh, joint. Uh, as, as I said, I will show you later um, because this is sometimes confused um, with um, another position, but important to know this. Um, the sniffing position, if you combine these two, you might get to what you call the buoy the bed up, head up, or ramping position, which is used um, especially for obese patients, where you get their ear to sternal notch as well. There's a bit of terminology problems here, and um, that's why I, I go through this in a bit of detail. So first of all, sniffing position. If you have your patient here, 
then what you, there's these two movements that you want the patient to do, which is extension at the atlantoaxial joint here. Look up, <laughs> you might also, also, also say. And then you want them to flex at their lower cervical vertebrae. So that would be looking forward. So look up and look forward like that. Okay. Another quick way that Weingart has done a video on is just say, smell the flowers. Flowers. Ooh, flowers. So this is usually the moment, the move, if you try to put some flowers in, in front of someone, then this is the movement they usually would do because they want to look up so that their nose is in the flowers and you want to move a bit of a bit of head um, with your head so that you can smell the flowers. Okay, so yeah, so that's, that is the sniffing position um, and also called flex tension sometimes. This is the optimal, according to Rich Levitan and, and some other of these gurus, the optimal position for uh, intubation because it gives you the straightest um, line of sight into the trachea. There are certain situations where it's not possible, for instance, with if you have a cervical spine immobilization uh, in a trauma case um, and there are certain people or there's there is some argumentation about whether or not there are other methods that are a bit better but you again i'm no expert in this but most most um, of the studies that i've read and the, the gurus that i um, hear from uh, recommend that you do the flex tension position when intubating um, if you do fibroscopy, which is as much a teaching tool for assessing or for, for getting to know the airway as a uh, diagnostic tool as well and in the cl clinic clinic, um, then you can if you if you ever like do flexible fibroscopy on anyone, you can see if they move from this position to this position. That is. <clears throat> really clear that their airway is opening and now you can suddenly see everything so try to like let them quietly move between these two positions and see the difference so uh, that's a visual way of of seeing this um this uh, effect um just to visualize here um this is a um another um more um, anatomically correct um person here where we um uh, have your um extension of the your um you, you have extended your uh, this joint here the atlanto uh, actual joint um you have flexed your uh, cervical spine and you achieve what you might call, um, you haven't quite achieved what you call uh, your sternal notch because your sternal notch is here, but you have at, at least achieved um, flex tension here. This is what you call flex tension. Um, it's, I, I've put uh, your sternal notch here. That is not to totally correct because your sternal notch is here. But <clears throat> often you do what you call um, elevation of the bed, as I, as I alluded to. And here you do achieve your your sternal notch, but you you are not uh, um, you're extended now in, in in this joint, and and your airway is quite closed. This is why your ramping position, uh, or you bet up head up position B U H E, would be the combination of your sniffing position and your um, 30 degrees here, and you and then you achieve your ear to sternal notch, which is for many, the ideal uh, intubation position, especially for obese patients. Okay, back to the basics here, uh, which are not simple. <laughs> okay, suction. So we can suck the airway uh, for mucus, if uh, and oftentimes there's a miracle for a lot of patients. Um, it's important to know that all of the um, anticholinergics that you can give for um, um, for highly salivating patients um, uh, and for a lot of like phlegm in your airways will, will not help right now. It will not help for the phlegm that is there right now. It will help for the phlegm that will get um, created afterwards. That's especially important in 
your palliative patients, um, you need to give that before they become um, uh, slimy or before the airways get airways uh, get um, um, a bit obstructed. When they are obstructed, you have to suck the airways. And how do you suck? Uh, how do you, how do you apply suction to the airways? Well, there is you have your soft uh, suction device. Um, you will you will use a suction of around 25 at the max um, kilopascal. In children, it's half that. And then you will um, suck by you will apply suction by well choosing a tube. I'm not quite sure how important the colors are, especially in adults. Maybe in children they're more important, but uh, what I know and what I've heard from the courses, they are not that important the, co um, the, the, the colors. But you you can um, you can I can be mistaken here. But you what you do is you go into the airway without suction, and then you um, when you when you get to where you want, then you then you apply suction all the way up um, through the airway. Um, these tubings connect to this um, suction device, and this suction device connects to the wall where you have your uh, 20 to 25 kilopascal of suction ready. Um, when you push your hand here, then it will uh, suck, and if you, when you remove it, then it will not. That's how you do it. You can do suction um, through tracheostomies or through a tube or through an LMA. And you can also approve your suction by using it in conjunction with your um, nasopharyngeal airway or oropharyngeal airway. Then you also have your stiff um, suction device, which is often called a Yankauer um, because of the manufacturer. This is especially needed in what you call the dirty airway through a salad technique where you want to suck dry the um, airway for uh, aspiration before do, uh, putting in the tube. And this consists of you putting in one or two Yankauer um, suction devices with a 25 kilopascals and then just leaving it there to suck all the um, aspiration up. Um, before you do your intubation, or meanwhile you're doing intubation, um, so you can lead with your, as, as shown in these videos, and there are several YouTube videos of this, um, you can lead with your laryngoscope, sorry, lead with your Yankauer, and, and then then just behind your Yankauer you can have your laryngoscope, and then you can um, get the entire airway sucked up. For smack, there is the um, salad commando, I think, uh, the achievement that you can get as well if you manage to uh, suck a very, very dirty airway. Okay. But and this should be probably sh should be at the bedside uh, at every uh, RSI intubation, but I have yet to see them uh, frequently at the bedside when our uh, colleagues intubate in Sweden. So um, it's an important thing uh, to have that in mind. There is a risk when you do suction, and that's primarily the risk of laryngospasm. It's a, a very low risk, but it's a um, not a. It is a risk that are, is always uh, there when you manipulate the airways, and that's why sometimes nurses don't want us to, uh, don't want to suck suck deep in the airways. That's something that we have to do. There's also a minor risk of bleeding, of course, and if you have a very delicate airway, there might be a risk of obstruction and edema in the air by by man mechanical manipulation. But mainly the risk of laryngospasm is often cited, and I'll just go through laryngospasm, how to how to deal with that. So, first 10 EM has has a great block on this on this. Um, so laryngospasm is mainly seen in children, um, and it's where your vocal cords shut um, tight so that you can breathe, and you mainly find out about it when the patient uh, has strider or sudden, uh, maybe strider if there's a bit of air coming through, but if there isn't, then then they won't um, be able to have any stride at all. They will just they will just have paradoxical um, paradoxical airway breathing because when you you can try to breathe against a closed glottis, a closed vocal cords. If you try to do that, you can see your stomach going out, but your thorax going in. That would be paradoxical breathing, so that's what you would see. Okay, and a very panicky patient. Um, 
in what I from what I can gather, not a lot of my colleagues have seen this ever, um, neither in anesthesiology nor in emergency medicine. But what you do if this happens theoretically is that you will apply jaw thrust. You will uh, press what you call the laryngospasm notch here, uh, right here, which is really painful. And maybe it's because it's painful. Maybe it's because of other reasons. Maybe nerve stimulation. That uh, this sometimes help. This also calls the Larson maneuver. If you want to look it up, and then you can apply CPAP to try to open up the OAs. If that doesn't help. Then the rest of this algorithm is you have to do and perform an sedation and RSI, where especially the muscle, the muscle relax, relaxant, um, either rocuronium or uh, succicolin, uh, uh, are the ones that will um, make it go away. But then you have to intubate the patient afterwards. So that's how you handle laryngospasm. That is, that is always a um, minor but severe risk of manipulating airway with any device, suction, fiber optics, anything. Okay. Okay, so on to our maneuvers. So we already already talked a little bit about the chin lift. The chin lift is performed by uh, or the the main purpose of the chin lift is to open your airway to get the tongue out of the way. Um, and in adults and um, children that are post-pubescent, um, uh, then the maneuver will open the airway. You put your um, one hand on the uh, forehead and one finger or two fingers uh, below the chin and, and hyper uh, extend you know, the patient's um, head. Uh, this is not. This is just the first part of the um, uh, flex tension, right? Um, the sniffing position, but but this is um, this is uh, for non-intubation purposes a good uh, way of of handling the airway. Uh, remember, when you for intubation you wanted to pull this uh, forward, and that's because you also want to have a straight view um, into the airway. Okay, for children it's a bit different. I don't have the picture here, but for children in general, you will put a uh, for really small children. We're talking about below one age, one year of age. You will put a towel below their uh, shoulders because their head is quite big compared to their body, so, and their their airway is more um, collapsible. So they will need a neutral position, um, and then the older they get, the more hyperextension they need. How much is a matter of um, how the child, how the child look. Um, so if they are post pubescent and they look old enough for uh, to be an adult, then they probably should be treated as an adult. Anywhere is anywhere um, below that is in between neutral position and a bit high hyperextension. Okay, then you have your other basic uh, maneuver, which is the draw the jaw thrust. And sometimes the jaw thrust is done uh, wrong. Um, this is from Ruben Strayer's uh, PSA tri uh, trilogy lecture. I cannot emphasize enough. Go look that, look up uh, his that lecture and also his BVM lecture. They were amazing. Um, but the main thing you're trying to achieve is you're trying to give the patient an underbite, right? <clears throat> this doesn't necessarily um, need. You don't don't necessarily need to apply a lot of pressure here. You just need to apply it right. Usually, you have to have your thumbs here. You can either use your the the, the um, pointy uh, end of your thumb, <laughs> or the a flatter surface of your thumb. Your, your entire um, um, belly of the thumb here. And then, most importantly, keep your hands here at the ankle. Of the, uh, the the here the ramus and the angle of the, your um, of the mandible not down here, especially not with short, small children down here because they have a lot of uh, soft tissue that can um, obstruct the airway. But also in adults, it's not in efficient because you want to uh, push the jaw forward, not not close the mouth. Okay, in my opinion, there are certain um, advantages. Uh, like um, for using the jaw thrust instead of the chin lift in the in, in the emergency department, the most the, most of them is that for trauma, 
um, this doesn't heal, you can do this in trauma as well it doesn't manipulate manipulate the neck like this does but it can also be used in uh, it's also the it can it, this technique can be combined with your bvm um especially if you want to uh, bvm like back valve mask uh, with a um, double hand uh, grip uh for a difficult patient then that that is the, this is the technique you want to use and also it can be combined with your langer langer specimen maneuver um, putting a your little finger in the um in the larson's notch um so i think this is a, if you want one of them you you, you should probably use uh, the jaw thrust i think because that is applicable in, in almost all situations uh, which the chin lift isn't okay here was the link to the um uh, the em updates um trilogy here uh, on psa and basic maneuvers <clears throat> okay so these were the basic maneuvers here um, we will move on to the uh, basic airway plus things now okay so let's move on to these adjuncts so one of the ma main adjuncts we use is the nasopharyngeal airway or in swedish called neskantarell or in danish uh, called uh, nesetrompet i can't remember anymore <laughs> um, but the thing is this is a um, tube which has the purpose of getting behind the tongue not into the airway but behind the tongue and, and li lie right here so that the tongue doesn't occlude the airway uh, this is this has to do with something uh, like when you have a patient that has a low gcs usually their to the tone of their airway which is something anesthesiologists love to talk about and which is important but it's often neglected um, the tone of the airway is quite bad it, it's, it's low so um, the everything is falling this way <laughs> and, and collapsing and that's why one of these devices are really good for that um, there's a few really important things about this the size is really important um, you measure the size by going from soft to soft meaning going from the soft nose to the soft um, earlobe like seen here um, the, the reason why this is important is if you push it in too long then this can actually obstruct the airway you can go all the way down into the trachea and then you can obstruct the airway and create a problem so that's important then you have um, your contraindications I guess there is a there is one case casuistic in, in in the literature what I know of where, where it has gone into the brain uh, in a trauma patient that doesn't mean that you should not use it in trauma patients when like or you can't put anything into the nose of trauma patients in any situations because sometimes there's a low risk of this being a head injury and there's a high risk of airway, airway compromise if you don't do anything right now that being said in general you should not put anything into, into the nose of any patients in trauma settings until you know that there is no ba skull base fracture um you insert it by um giving the patient a pig snout like pulling pulling the nose up um, and then going along the floor just like you would have rapid rhino or anything else you put into the nose don't go up as you might think by the angle of the nose you go straight ahead um before doing it you can use uh, some gel the gel can be either silocaine which is not going to work right now but it's going to make it more comfortable um, in the next couple of minutes and the next couple of hours when it's lying there depending on depending on the half-life of the uh, silocaine or lidocaine otherwise you can just use any kind of gel uh, that you would use in the hospital um, if you don't want the energetic energetic part um, of it um, somewhat important don't don't um, don't use a lot of gel in this area and maybe not at all because this thing is going down into the airway and has a free passage into the trachea so if you put a lot of gel here and you put it in then there might be you might get some gel into the uh, airway and also important you can combine this uh, nasopharyngeal airway with any um, 
and with most other devices to improve them, their effic efficacy, like the BVM especially. But you can also suck, uh, use suction again, uh, through it. Then you have your oropharyngeal airway. And the oropharyngeal airway, usually I would say, is both a diagnostic uh, test and a management thing for airway problems. The reason why it's a diagnostic test is that you need to be quite sedated to be able to accept an oropharyngeal airway. If you're, uh, if you're not quite sedated, then you will often pull it out or you will throw up. Um, so if a patient is accepting their oropharyngeal airway, then it's an indication for you to need to think about, is this patient stable enough to keep being uh, like they are, or should they actually um, be intubated? Um, and that is back to the question of whether they're they're going down in their GCS or up, and whether it's reversible or not. Okay. So you have to choose the correct size here as well. This is this was soft to soft. This is heart to heart. So your heart front teeth to to the um, uh, angle of your mandible. Um, you uh, there's the contraindication here is that they won't accept it. Uh, as I alluded to, um, and this is an important concept because, yeah, if they can't accept it, then oh, sorry, if they can't accept it, then probably they will. Um, you will need to consider intubation. Um, I forgot to mention here: you can always always put in two of these, and usually you don't have to be that sedated to actually accept this. So most patients can can lie with this without any problem. And they don't have to be intubated for that reason. But these, you should really consider that. Insertion is for adults, upside down. And then you turn it um, 180 degrees once you come into the mouth. Um, you can use this technique with children as well. I've, uh, and, uh, and you can use a 90 degrees technique as well, where you put it in at a 90 degrees angle and then turn it. Whichever works in the situation. The main, main thing is that you get behind the tongue so that the tongue is lying here. In Danish, in Danish it's called a tunge um, holder, uh, like holding the tongue, and in Swedish it's called a um, um, I think the Danish name here is the better one uh, for describing what it is uh, doing. Um, this, this one you can also combine with suction, um, and um, you can optimize the patient fully with two nasopharyngeal airways and an oropharyngeal airway and a, uh, so that your BVM can be optimally applied. But that is a situation where you usually want to intubate the patient right after. Okay. On to the BVM. I put this under the symbol ones um, because sometimes this is something that we are, as emergency physicians, um, uh, th sorry, this is something that we need as an emergency physician to, to know about. Um, but in the, uh, in the Vortex model, it would be considered a, a more advanced airway thing. The back valve mask is usually, or, or the Rubens, um, um, Rubens um, Blosa, um, uh, Rubens Ballon, uh, named after the Danish anesthesiologist, <laughs> um, it consists of a, um, a mask, and many anesthesiolo anesthesiologists will tell you that this um, mask is not good. The one that they come with uh, is too um, too squishy, um, and it's sometimes it's better to get a harder harder one, um, which can, which uh, is to be found in most emergency rooms. Um, one made of silicone, I think they are uh, the the other ones. Then there's a, um, a balloon, which can blow air into your mask. And then there's a reservoir. And it's important that the reservoir is fully uh, inflated with air. Uh, sorry, with oxygen. If you wanted to be really nerd about this, George Kovac has a really like expert walkthrough of these. And also Scott Weingart has it. Uh, because they believe that knowing your device inside and out is uh, one of the main things you need to do as a um, emergency physician, especially if, if you have a lot of these cases, because then you can assemble it and you can disassemble it and you can you can know the ins and outs when it's not working. And I think there's a lot of merit to that argument. It's not just it's just not for all of us. If we have a lot of other areas that we need to cover, we can't be hyper experts of everything. But if you want, check out Kovacs and Weingart's videos on this. 
So, um, BVMs are really good, especially at ventilating the patients uh, if they are hypoventilating uh, and have a high PCO2. Um, here you can ventilate the patient and um, sometimes if you really want to be advanced about it, then you can um, apply a lot of devices to this. You can apply um, viral filters, you can apply uh, CPAPs, or so not CPAPs, but PEEP valves. You can apply uh, end tidal CO2s to these. And a lot of these things, this is what um, Kovach calls a super BVM. It also has a YouTube a video about that. Um, but the thing is about the back valve mask is um, you can you can even be more advanced when you when you want to if you have your entitled CO2 then you can um, then you can go around this what you call pulse ox lack and you can see when you're doing too much or too little and um, go check Kovac's video on this is is it's um, it's it's probably where we're going to head with with the back valve mask in a few years uh, that we need always to have an entitled CO2 on them um, and most of these devices there is a entitled CO2 that can be plugged into the device also if that doesn't work you can always plug it into the patients um, I think there is a chin um, monitor uh, or a like uh, in the angle of the mouth you can put it in there so you don't have to intubate the patient for using an entitled co2 um, far from it um, for really difficult cases like in the uh, coning or almost coning patients the the, the, the patient with a high uh, inter intracerebral pressure um, I'm told that you you would um, you you have to you you don't want to hyperventilate them too much because then the PCO2 will go too far down and then they will vasoconstrict and if they go if you if you uh, if you don't um, uh, if you do it too slowly then you won't get the benefit of of uh, lowering the PCO2 so there's a sweet spot a very narrow window and that's why it's uh, that's partly why it's controversial is also because it's a mechanical argument uh, not a uh, as I'm told evidence-based um, um, argument and especially not on um, patient oriented outcomes so um, but in these there will probably never be evidence uh, in this area that is really strong and especially not in patient oriented outcomes because uh, traumatic brain injuries is, is about small factors adding up to a lot um, so this is one of the small factors that we need to do right in the situation and if you want to calibrate this really good then you should um, take a take an uh, arterial blood gas and then um, com calibrate it uh, towards your end uh, or calibrate it um, towards your end title co2 and then you have then you kind of know where to go I think it's um, and I'm not quite sure but I think it's like four 4.5 um, kilopascals of PCO2 yeah, that you need to aim for. That's a really hard uh, sweet spot there. Okay, um, before I go on, Ruben Strayer has made a great video arguing that the back valve mask is probably one of the main things that we need to know um, because it's so um, amazing uh, and it can always save the situation if you're good at this. Um, so go check that video out as well. Okay, if you want to assess, uh, I had it on the previous slide, the Moans algorithm. If you want to assess whether or not this is going to be a hard um, um, back valve mask patient, um, some of the factors are if they have their own teeth. It's important that they do have their own teeth here, because then they they're they're like the the structure of the face is much better. It's not as flappy. So um, put in the teeth here, but put them out when they. Um, uh, when they're going to do intubation. Um, also, if you have a beard, if you have a, um, uh, a beard that is really, if you have time, then you should cut the beard or shave the beard. Um, and if if it's it's always important to like do a double jaw thrust or do, do a double CE grip um, so that someone else can can push the back because um, this is uh, like uh, really really important to do this right. Um, when you do the double hand grip, 
the main reason uh, you shouldn't push too hard. You have to um, apply even pressure, even pressure um, uh, around all of this uh, surface, because if you if you apply uh, too hard pressure on one side, then you will just have a leak on the other side. So the main thing is not to press press hard; it's to press evenly, and that's that's an important point. All right, and that that is really well achieved with the double hand grip because you have everything in your hands and you can feel when there's a leak and so on. You can optimize, as we talked about, with the uh, orofaryngeal airway times one or two. <laughs> you can do a, a nasal, uh, sorry, it's a nasopharyngeal airway times one or two and an orofaryngeal airway at times one, uh, not two. And you can optimize by doing a double hand grip. The ventilation is, well, how many, the respiratory rate, if it's, um, then you'll just, if it's uh, 12, then you will say 60 seconds in a minute divided by 12, and then you have um, and then you have um, um, five or six seconds here, and then then you just count one, two, three, four, six, and then blow. And the thing is, you should not, you should never blow a lot. You should just blow easily. The esophageal sphincter. Uh, there's a number there that that is important. That is 20. Um, I think it's uh, 20 millimeters of mercury um that is the like the pressure it might be kilopascal i'm not sure um but but it's 20 that is important there um and if you if you blow blow more force forceful than that then then the air won't go into the trachea it will go into the stomach and that's also a number that we need to remember when you're doing your niv because if you do your CPAP or uh, or your BiPAP with pressures higher than 20, um, then there's a risk of mechanical, um, theoretical risk of them blowing you blowing a lot of air into the stomach. If you're really really good at this, and um, then and you can like only focus on this for your patient. It will take all of your cognitive ability usually. Then you can ventilate with your patient. If they're not breathing, then you just ventilate as you want to um, in this, uh, according to the respiratory frequency and the PCO2 that you want. But if you, but if you're awake, then you, then you can gently pressure the, the back to see if, when it gives, because when, it, if this is a close, if you have a tight seal and this is a closed system, when the patient breathes in, then this will um, um, collapse a little bit, and you can feel that in your hand. So when this collapses a bit, then you will blow in because then then that's a breath in, and um, so that's that would be like breathing with the patient. And then you, if they have a if they are hypoventilating, then you will add some breaths in between, and that and 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 then when you feel like they're breathing out, then you shouldn't breathe, um, then you shouldn't push. This is really it, this is high concentration work. It really demands something of the patient and the person handing the airway, and they cannot focus on anything else while they're doing it. Um, we already talked about that, especially in kids. Yeah, kids are really um, the ones who can who are high risk of you blowing up their stomach. So, especially in kids. When, once you're doing it, you, you will confirm it by looking at the chest, you look at the saturation curve, but especially, and we should probably get into this much more, um, the entitled CO2, you will check. Um, okay. And as I said, this can be combined with a lot of valves and a lot of uh, stuff. Um, check out Kovac's video. We talked about distributing the pressure. We, when you hold, when you're going to ventilate the patient for a long time, you might want to do a underhand grip instead of an overhand grip because that is might be more comfortable. You might want to ease your um, your CE grip if you're doing one-handed um, every time you're not blowing into the patient's mouth because then you won't um, get cramps in your hands. Um, but most times you want to do a double hand grip if if it's hard. Um, and always make sure that the reservoir is full, otherwise they won't, you won't get the benefit of the mask.
Okay, moving on to an area that is a bit controversial in Denmark. Um, and I just wanted to talk to you, my colleagues in Denmark, about this because we do it a lot in my hospital, in the emergency department, and we are the ones applying this. Um, NIV, uh, non invasive ventilation, is like a ventilator, a, a minor ventilator. Um, and there's a great video about the rule of twos by Haney Melamath uh, at this link. Uh, on how to actually apply, uh, how to how to like how to easily know how to treat most patients in this um, situation. Um, so the rule of twos is just about um, the two kinds of respiratory failure that we have. You have hypercapnic failure, and you have hypoxic failure. And the hypercapnic pa pa patient, um, the hy hypercapnic respiratory failure, is the patient with dyspnea who has also a high PCO2. For these patients, you have you have two settings. Like if you you have only two settings, you have EPAP and you have IPAP. And if you want to like go into the details of what they do and how they differ from BiPAP, how they differ from from PEEP and CPAP, then you can feel free to go on a rabbit hole in a YouTube um, journey. But I'll just say EPAP. Um, it's much like PEEP and CPAP, and IPAP is. Um, Something that uh, will help the patient breathe as well. Um, I don't want to go into details here um, about this uh, because this is not this lecture. But in general, we have um, if you have so, so these two variables are important. And if you have your hypercapnic failure, then you will uh, need to increase your uh, uh, the, your what you call your delta the. Um, uh, the diff discrepancy between the EPAP and the IPAP. Usually you will start off with an EPAP of 5 and an IPAP of 10. And then you will slowly increase uh, as the patient is getting more comfortable. Um, if they're really uncomfortable, you will maybe use very low pressures to begin with, like an EPAP of 2 or 3 and an IPAP of 5 or something like that. You don't, you don't, if, if the patient has a purely hypoxic problem, you actually only need to use the CPAP, but usually it will be more comfortable for the patient to also use IPAP. But you can also just use CPAP. CPAP, CPAP is just a bit of pressure against your, um, against your, um, when you breathe, um, and it, like it keeps the airwaves uh, a bit open uh, during your, um, uh, during the entire period. Uh, Judge Korvach has some great videos on why CPAP is great, um, and where they where, where you see a lung inflating and keeping keeps being inflated. Okay, so like the main thing here rule is that for hypercapnic failure, like the COPD patient with a PCO2 of 13, that's where you want to increase your delta. So you start off with maybe a EPAP of five and an EPAP of 10. You don't have to have a lot of EPAP, you can just EPAP of 2 and an uh, IPAP of 7. That's a delta of 5. Um, and then you will just slowly increase your delta. So if you start off with an EPAP of um, 2, then you'll um, increase your delta by going only up in your IPAP, so 7, 8, 9, 10, until you have an effect. And you will um, take a venous blood gas or an arterial blood gas, but mainly a venous blood gas in Sweden, um, as long as you need to, um, so that you see that they're going the right way. Um, your hypoxic failure patient will need CPAP, and usually um, this is where you, this would be your pulmonary uh, edema patient, your your um, SCAPE, your um, uh, sympathetic, um, um, highly sympathetic patient with pulmonary edema. Um, yeah, the thing is, uh, so a, f a few other points about this is like you should start low, um, especially if they are really uncomfortable. It's like, um, it's, it feels like um, if you've ever been skydiving or putting your head out in out in uh, out uh, from a moving car, and while it's driving, it's like breathing against air. It's it's hard uh, and it's it's uncomfortable. So start low if they're if they're if they're if they don't like it, and then go up. 
there are some contraindications to this, and we'll get into, into a few of them. But the, the main thing about NIV is um, often these patients, especially if they're COPD patients, you don't want. Like one of the contraindications is that is that if they're GCS of like below, I don't know, 14, 13, if they if they're unconscious, and I agree, if they're totally unconscious, then it's a problem. But it depends on what you are. Um, what, what your other options are. Many of the, these patients with COPD, you don't want to intubate because usually they are at the end of the line. They are terminally, uh, terminally ill in their COPD if they are so bad, in a such a bad way that they're almost unconscious. Not always, but oftentimes. So this might be their only option. And then you might as well try. Um, um, and in your pulmonary edema patients, well, sometimes you don't actually want to, well, sometimes they have a pressure that is uh, on the on the boundary. Uh, maybe you don't want to um, give them nit nitroglycerin because they have a heart that is failing and you need to try to give them uh, just a bit of nib, just a f small pressures to get them uh, incrementally better. So sometimes even though um, many of the country indications are there. I would consider them to be very relative, depending on the situation, but depending on what other options you have. It's important to know that when you use NIV, then the um, the pressure, the interthoracic pressure, will go up. So if you uh, so uh, and and that will um, put um, put pressure on the vena cava, which will uh, diminish preload to the heart, which will um, diminish. Um, your blood pressure. So, in general, um, you will get a little bit hypotensive with this, and that is important to notice, especially if you have a hypotensive patient. But um, it's reversible oftentimes. So, if you just take off the mask, then you will have reversed it, which is something that you cannot do with nitroglycerin usually in these patients. Okay. Um, then there is the thing about usually there's a combination of these two that's why we often start with uh, epep of 5 ipep of 10 and then you can always adjust depending on whether you should uh, whether there's mainly a pco2 problem or mainly a hypoxic problem um, then you also have to adjust the oxygen usually you can adjust it between 20 21 um, percent which is room air and up to 100 percent and what you want to do is that you, oftentimes you can just, if they are hypo hypoxic and not in severe COPD, then you will start at 100. Even if they have COPD, you will start at 100, but just remember to go down um, afterwards um, when they're stabilized. So you, you start at 100% and then you go down um, until you maintain your saturation at once. Um, according to international guidelines, that would usually be in COPD, in severe COPD especially, uh, 88 to 92. And... Uh, with everyone else, well, above 92, 93% um, of saturation. So um, then you can also, uh, there's a lot of other, what you might call um, uh, comfortability adjustments you can do, and also air leak um, you can adjust. And I won't go into these, but you can make the patient, when they are stabilized, you can make them more comfortable. Uh, um, and there are nuances to how they de deliver the breath, how they, um, how, how big tidal volumes they, they blow into the lungs, so on and so forth, depending on the size of the patient and so on. And that's, this is where you go into the ventilator physiology. And if you want to go into that, you can check out uh, Scott Weingart's uh, Dominating the Vent lecture. Okay, um, yeah. Then there's there's the important thing of indication and when not to use it. And when not to use it, as I alluded to, there's no real contraindications for this. Um, depend, it's, it really depends on the patients. And most of the patients that really have a good benefit for these, this device, you really won't want to, you, don't, you often don't have any, any other options. Um, but there are but there are some contraindications, or you should know when you should do something else. And this is mainly evidence based in your cardiogenic lung edema um, and re related uh, areas. This is this is from the uh, the SIM, um, uh, guidelines on on NIV, uh, the Danish um, the Danish Society. Um, so 
uh, where you have your um, treatment failure, your, your risk of treatment failure. Um, and uh, the thing is that the, the risk of treatment failure here is really low in cardiogenic uh, pulmonary edema, and you have a um, and but uh, but in in other patient categories like pneumonia, um, there is a bigger risk. Of course, we have a high high um, high um, level of experience now with COVID and NIV, um, but it's not totally clear as I understand it. There is some evidence from the, there, there are some quite uh, good evidence from the recovery trial that that NIV may, may be um, better than better than um, OptiFlow or the other high flow alter alternatives. Um, but um, you should go read that study for uh, in details for to, to know which kind of patients and so on. I think St. Emlins had, had done a, um, a summary of this. But the main thing here is. Um, the patient that we want to use this for mainly is this cardiogenic lung, uh, cardiogenic um, pulmonary edema and your COPD patients. Um, maybe your pneumonias, your asthma patients are at high risk because they have a high intrathoracic um, pressure. You may sometimes use it, but it's not not something that you really want to do as as first line or even second line. Um, and then sometimes, then there's always like your COVID. Um, well, it, it's probably one of the better things um, to use for your COVID patients, especially if you have your not the face mask but the entire uh, like helmet uh, device. Uh, yeah. Okay. So if you have, let's just do a quick case. You have a dyspnea patient who has a heart failure with a uh, with a reduction, uh, re reduced uh, uh, ejection fraction at a 30%. They come in panicky and with a high respiratory rate and a high uh, way of breathing. They have, a, they have hypertension and they have a saturation of 84 um, on three liters. POGIS uh, shows B lines all over um, and you have an ABG with a, P, a PO2 of this on on three liters and pco2 and lactate okay so your niv um this, your your recommendation here is to give niv and nitro and the furex this is probably a pulmonary uh, edema so here you as i alluded to start with cpap uh, epap of five ipap of 10. you don't really need the ipap if you're really in a struggle you can just do cpap and you can do what you call seep but and then you can do a um, delta, then that would be a delta of five because 10 minus five is five. And that would be for the, the, uh, the CO2 retention because they're tiring out here. So here you have a mainly hypoxic problem. So you mainly use the, e, the EPAP, but you might always, uh, you might, you might always also have a little use for your um, delta because of the PCO2. Okay, so let's say you have a scenario where the patient becomes more hypoxic, um, then you uh, or they they don't become better. Then you will increase your CPAP with uh, every uh, to as much as they need. Usually, as around maybe ten or um, twelve, um, maximum of twenty, as I alluded to before, because of the esophageal pressure. But you'll increase it with two. So how do you do that? Well, um, here. You will increase it like this. So you you have to keep your delta. If you want to have the benefit of your PCO2, you have to keep your delta. Otherwise, you will. Um, if you if you, you just, if you just adjust, if if you only go up two points in EPAP, then you will get go to seven here, and you'll get to ten here. Then you'll have a delta of three, which will diminish your PCO2. Um, um, uh, your 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 uh, ventilation. So, what you want to do is um, you you want to increase so that the delta is maintained, so, and you maintain your EPAP of seven. Okay, and then if you, they become more hypocatic, then you will use your um, then you you will, that this is where you want to increase your delta. Remember the rule rule of two here: if hypoxia, that's CPAP. Hypercapnia, that is the delta between the two that you want to increase. So here you will go from EPAP5 to IPAP12. Uh, sorry, you go, 
if you will do EPUB 5 and then iPad 12, um, which will give you an increased delta from 5 to, to 7 now. And you can go like this, iPad 14, iPad 16, then you will increase your delta, but just keep your EPUB the same, depending on whether the primary problem now is the PCO2 or, or the, it is the hypoxemia. In this case, the patient relaxes more and more when they got this treatment here, and you increased a bit with CPAP like this. And the ABG control on the VBG control in Sweden was good. Oh, side note, uh, I, I, I have no idea or why we're not using venous blood gases in Denmark um, as the mainstay, because it's very few conditions where you cannot just use the saturation, and it's harmful for patients to do the ABG. So, um, yeah, just a side note. Um, okay. Okay, now we moved all the way through the algorithm almost. We will now go to flexible fibroscopy and we'll go to LMA as well. So LMA first. Um, there are different kinds of LMAs um, and the one you see in operation theories are this classical LMA. This is something where you. This is one where you have to adjust the pressure here. And the problem with this is that it can kink on the way in, so you need to have a finger in the mouth of the patient to actually put it in. Um, in the emergency setting and pre-hospitally, we have moved to this more expensive but very much better uh, in, in at least easier to um, insert, uh, the iGel, it's called. And then you have this like old device called the iLMA, the intubating LMA. And this is something that I have never used. I've never heard anyone use it in the emergency department or in, um, I, I haven't heard a lot of colleagues use it in anesthesiology either. So it's mainly these two you need. But I put it I put it along here because um, the Swissum guidelines tells us that we need to know how to place one, even though you will probably never need to do so, um, because you can intubate through these as well and, and these as well. Um, so that's, that's, that was the main purpose of this, you can intubate through it. All right, the contraindications are um, like, is pathology on the vocal cords, like epiglottitis or around the vocal cords, or if they don't accept a um, OPA, so they can Mm. They are uh, sedated too, uh, too shallow. They need to be sedated for for, for getting this, or they need to be really uh, GCS free, not just maybe GCS free. They have, have to be really just out. Um, this is not a secure airway, even though it does protect somewhat. It's not a total safe airway um, in the definition that we mentioned in the beginning of this lecture. So. Um, you always use the eye gel if you can, because that's the easy, it's like easier, almost idiot proof. You insert it by standing behind the patient. You apply a loop to the uh, to the um, to this area, not the not uh, not below, not the one that is going to sit on the airway. Then you pinch the jaw and the tongue between your fingers. You also use the hold the tongue because then you can um, hold back the tongue, which is usually the problem when inserting it, and then you. Um, pull the patient's jaw for forward, uh, like a jaw thrust, but using it, uh, but but having your, the mouth, the, the the fingers in the pa patient's mouth, and then you insert it, uh, just by sliding it through, until it um, uh, goes all the way in. Usually, you will be able to hear air leakage, um, and you also every time you insert it, you will check for e uh, entitled CO2 and and uh, air movement and so on. Then we go to fiber optics or flexible fiber fibroscopy. And there's a great video here uh, that goes through it from Oxford, I think. But in general, the, my, my very stylistic painting here is, um, this is supposed to be your nose here. Then you have your uh, nasopharynx, your oropharynx, which would be the mouth here. And, you, and then your larynx and epiglottis. So what you do when you want to go in with fiber optics is that you prepare, and I'll go through that, and then I'll go through these steps, how do you go, go through it. Fiber optics is mainly used for a few indications here. 
um, if your patients have some kind of feeling of obstructed airway, foreign body airway obstruction, but you're not quite sure, then you can look down. Um, you can use it to diagnose your airway obstruction. Maybe they have epiglottitis, or maybe they have something that um, something that you're not quite sure just by examining them. You need to look down into the airway. You can also assess the airway. Sometimes if you have a patient with angioedema, you can see if they're swollen in their airways. You can see if they have... Um, if you have inhalation injuries, there is always, usually we, we, we talked about, oh, if, the, if, if they have soot, soot in their face or in their nares, um, then they should be intubated, but that's definitely not the case anymore. Look at EM cases update on this, um, on burn and inhalation injuries. Um, one of the main things you want to see if do they have blisters in their oropharynx. Um, and that's something that you can see if, with your fiber optics. So there are a few indications for this in the emergency department. And also, it's there is a really good tool when you're doing airway assessment and trying to, to learn this stuff. And then it's a good tool to actually see the airways. It's something that Rich Levitan uses in his um, SMAC lecture at the workshop. Um, um, where people get, where you go to you get you get to see the airway of each other. There are some contraindications. Of course, there's always a risk of bleeding when you go into the, ner the nose, so you always have to be sure that you know how to treat an epistaxis. Either you have a rapid rhino place, or and you have to assess whether this patient really needs this. Is it a bleeding patient? Uh, like on warfarin and, and RNR of 10, they probably don't do it if you don't really need to. Um, but most patients will not bleed or bleed minimally so that you can just treat them as any other mm, conservative epistaxis uh, treatment. As we said earlier, there's always a risk of laryngospasm here when, when handling the airway, um, uh, when, when going down to the trachea. Um, you're not allowed to go all the way down on the, uh, to check if the patient has a high risk of epiglottitis. That uh, then you have to um, then you have to um, have a um, intubation uh, expert ready at bedside. And if there's a risk of aspiration, if they're vomiting a lot, then probably don't do it. Um, all right. So step number zero here before like the preparation inform the patient of what you're doing position the patient in the sniffing position optimally they're sitting up and they are they're in this sniffing position um, um maybe some 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 chairs can actually um, help doing this sometimes you'll just lie the patient uh, in a 30 degrees angle and you'll stand behind them and then you'll do this procedure it depends on the situation. Oftentimes, if it's not not an emergency, we'll just have them sitting up. Then you will um, use silocaine or or with or without some kind of detumescating agent. Um, so, um, and I usually use only silocaine, but I know you know you know some ENT doctors usually use a combination. And whatever you use, you will usually have a spray um, and you will uh, ask the patient to um, uh, oh, you will inform the patient that it does taste a bit bad and it may hurt a little bit because of um, it, it cinches a little bit um, but then you'll uh, blow two or three um, um, sprays into their nose and then they'll have to snort in uh, all they can um, And when you choose the nostril to go in through, usually you can you can do an obstructive test, like ask if they can um, snort in through um, the left and then the right uh, nostril, um, and then see which one has the best passage. All right, then you enter the nose, and with your non-dominant hand, for me it's my left hand, I will hold my fourth and fifth finger on the patient's nose, and then I'll, with the first and second finger, uh, hold the tip of the scope and then um, with the dominant hand I have uh, I have on the controls of the fiber scope um, and you can use um, two kinds of techniques there is either the fishing rod where you have the controls on the top or you can have the classical style where you have 
your um, your controls on the bottom. Um, whichever you use is up to you. Um, I use the classical style, um, but I know a lot of ENC doctors use the fishing rod style. And the only thing you need to know is that the picture will be inverted if you use the fishing rod style. Um, and then it's important once you have your once you like where you look is important. So you start looking at the patient's nose, and once you can't see the tip of the catheter anymore, then you will. Um, then we then you will look to the camera to the fiber optic camera, so you know where you're going. Um, and then you will just keep looking at the camera. Oh, so, oh, the, oh sorry, the video display. Okay. Um, also important to know is you advance the scope by um, your using your left hand. Um, so you you will just um, you will just push and push. With your left hand, um, and it's important if you go wrong at any point, if you don't, if you don't see where you are, then you just pull out. If you go out, if you go wrong, then you'll pull a bit out, and then you'll, and then you'll try to advance once more. That's one of the main like key tips. <laughs> okay, at some point you will go to the, you will come to the nasopharynx. Once you're in the nasopharynx, you will, um, you will, with your dominant hand, adjust the tip of the scope so it can look down. And you, when it looks down, then you'll just advance, and then you'll straighten it out again. So this is the fiber scope, and you'll look down, and then you'll just advance. Um, and then you can, when you see the vocal cords, you can just make the patient see the uh, use uses the voice and. Um, there are different voices, um, things you can can practice here. You don't for emergency physicians. I, I I think of this as a like a focus. It's not a total assessment of the airway or the vocal cords. It's just I want to see is there an obstruction, is there edema, is there something specific. So you don't need to do too much um, when we are down there. When you pull back, then you then it's important to release the handle uh, so that the the handle is on a, in a neutral position so that you don't scrape the patient all the way up with a uh, with a uh, down downwards angled um, fibroscope. Okay, so there's a few troubleshooting things. Sometimes there's fogging um, or there's slime on the on the scope on the camera uh, of the scope and then. Usually you can you can either use antifog um, agents. Uh, I don't usually use that um, because it doesn't. For me, it usually doesn't matter. Um, I can usually it doesn't. Uh, you don't need that kind of resolution. Um, um, the thing is, if you have a bad view, you can just make the patient go into a sniffing position, or um, if you have a bad view, view down here, or if you if you don't know where you are, you can just move back. Um, and then, of course, bleeding, epistaxis uh, treatment as per usual, and laryngospasm. Then you'll use the lary laryngospasm um, technique that I showed uh, in the earlier uh, the earlier parts of this video. Okay, and here we come to the vortex and the kaiko. The last part of this um, uh, this basic uh, airway management, and a little bit advanced. <laughs> Okay, so the Vosic method, I just went through it. This is how it actually looks. Um, instead of my model, you have all the adjuncts down here. These are optimizing measures. You can man manipulate, you can use the adjuncts as OPA and MPA and so on. You can change the size, you can use suction, and you can use um, muscle tone, uh, muscle relaxants, and so on. Um, so that's kind of the same as I, as I just showed you. My model and their model are similar. This is what they call their lifeline uh, optimization tools. Um, okay, and just to re, uh, reiterate, maximum one attempt. For each attempt you use, you, they have this ready, set, go. So if you uh, ready, set, go technique towards your phone, to your, towards your phone in the middle. So first time you miss a thing, then you will bring the tracheostomy kit, uh, so, so the, the phone kit to the bedside. The second time you miss a um, miss um, miss one of these uh, lifelines then you will 
uh, mark the neck with a pen or in, and, and pull out the kit so that you're ready. And we, if you miss this, then you will go directly and then you're already prepared. Um, you jump in where you need to. Sometimes you will start here, sometimes you'll start here. It depends on the situation. Um, and also what competences are um, available. Um, <laughs> we as emergency physicians will not in Scandinavia go directly here. We will usually go here or here, maybe uh, just here, but arguments about this, but mainly here, um, depending on the situation. And we'll just wait until the competences arrive, then we'll go here uh, if needed. And it's important to, uh, a big part of this model is the shared mental model part of it. There's, you always have to explain plan A, plan B, and plan C. So if you start here, okay, then I'll say we start here, then we go here, then we go here, and then Fona or here, and then here, and then phone, or then here, or maybe A and B. Depends on the scenario, which kind of plans you make. The benefits of this model is that it's an all-in-one model. I think we have, with this, these lifelines and uh, many optimization tools, then you have all uh, area management here, um, I think. So this is one model that goes through both basic and um, advanced uh, airway management. It's also important that this creates a common language. So if you have a psychological safe team where you can come and say something to the one intubating, if you see a problem, then you empower your um, then you empower your um, team by knowing uh, by if they know about this model because uh, like the ABCD, your team knows. Oh, you you missed D. Here, the team you can say. Oh, you know you've actually tried this already once. You should move to the next instead of just trying and trying and trying um, one method. So it empowers the team and it, it makes it makes a, a better shared mental model and it creates a language for everyone to understand. It's important to notice that Fona is never a failure. If you go to, get to Fona, front of neck access, or crack with thyroidectomy in most cases, <laughs> uh, then uh, the reason why I say in most cases is because the ENT surgeons sometimes do a trick emergently because that's what they're used to or it's, it, the patient will need it or so on. But it's never a failure. It's just because the airway was hard. You tried everything else with your experience and so on. So that's a very important narrative that you're, you don't fail by doing going here. You need to, if you need to. Um, uh, yeah. And this is another um, way of saying this ready, set, go. As, as you drain your attempts, then you will go more and more um, for the Kaiko situation and you go more and more ready for the Fona. Okay. And here were the um, adjuncts for optimizing. And these are the adjuncts that you can use for optimizing your attempt. Um, so if you have, remember we said th maximum three attempts, but only one optimal attempt. So if you if you failed one attempt, then you have to try to optimize to be able to go at it again, change something, as Dr. Gallagher would usually say in his YouTube channels, change something from each time um, so that you optimize it. But in this approach, you will see that you cannot try unlimited amount of time. So you'll just move on if you think that that's what, what is an, that was an optimi optimal attempt. Um, unless an expert comes to the bedside, then you can try again. That's what they call a wild card. Okay, lastly in this part, we'll talk about uh, what you uh, what, uh, what we can call a halo, a high accuracy, low opportunity thing that we all need to know about. I made a... Um, blog about this as well, where I go into details about the cragothyroidectomy, but we'll just quickly um, go through this. So there's lots of uh, ways of handling a phone. Um, no one can ever be, the, the thing about halo high, um, high acuity, low opportunity scenarios is that it's something that no one can ever be an expert at. It's something that only happens maybe once or a handful of times in a career um, for the for the people who really places themselves in these situations a lot. So many of us will probably, most of us will never do this. We have to simulate this so that we, so we are comfortable 
going into any situation we know what kind of what kind of things need to happen if we end up in this situation so it, it, even though we might not end up there in that situation we will be able to be calm in situations because we know what to do this is one of um chris hatfield and an astronaut um, who has who has made a brilliant book called uh, astronaut's guide to life on earth where he argues that this is one of the ways we should go through life in these kind of, of environments that we work in as emergency physicians where there's lots, lots of uncertainty we need to be certain about the things that are might not happen but we have to think about them the scenarios when and when if they happen then we can fix it we know where where the trigger to make it is we know how to use it and also we need to make it easy because this is something that we will not remember if it's hard and it, we're in the really stressed situation and we haven't done it before so this is the easy way of doing this decision that's the hardest part of it then decision incision finger bushy tube once more decision incision finger bushy tube or sometimes just decision incision bushy tube but i i'll argue why we should maybe use our fingers okay so this is the airway through a, um, a point of care ultrasound image this is the head this is the lungs down here and you have your trachea your um your thyroid membrane your uh, crack uh, cricoid membrane oh sorry cricoid um cartilage and your thyroid cartilage and here's your crack with thyroid the cartilage where you need to cut down you have what what rich levitan calls the cartilaginous cartilaginous cage here don't be afraid to step right down because you won't go through to the esophagus here because there's a lot of cartilage on the on the back here okay so the first the decision the decision is the part, hardest part but i've already walked you through the vortex method um i've, I've talked about where this spiral it's not a a bad thing if you end up in phone in, in a phone situation that's just how it how it was especially if you have already tried kaiko you or, or you you come to the algorithms end part, point where it's kaiko sometimes though you don't need to come to the end point as rich levitan uh, talks about um sometimes some airways are just surgical inevitable you have to use a surgical airway um and this might be a little bit controversial not all uh, because the society of difficult airway um the difficult airway society they usually in their algorithms algorithms say that you have to try kaiko uh, until you get to kaiko but but i would argue and rich levison would argue that sometimes that would be an opportunity cost um in a time that you don't may, may might not have and and you will just make the airway more swollen by doing too much other things and rather in a more stable environment you can just try to do what you what you need to do instead of in a crisis um in a few minutes down the road do a uh, crash phone okay um the other side of that argument is that just one third of phonas actually succeed uh, according to the literature using other techniques than what i'm trying to show you here um, mainly the Seldinger technique doesn't really work in a, a crisis <laughs> um, so use this technique or something similar and use something that you've practiced practice one thing and then, then you know it when it happens so even though, even, you don't have to know all the nuances that I'm teaching you here and you don't need, don't need to use it but use whatever you um, are comfortable with and teach uh, like, like or or try or visualize it and use like micro motor skills so it, there in cases had a great dance that you can use as well uh, I've, I've put that on my block um, um, so um, but you made the decision that's the most important thing then what then you do the incision so the incision you will have to use some landmarks um, you'll use, use what you call the laryngeal handshake you will use your um, first and your third finger and um, usually I would stand on the patient's um, on the patient's right side and with my non-dominant hand my left hand I would um, 
uh, fixate the patient's um, um, thyroid um, cartilage with my th first and third finger, and then with my um, um, with my uh, th second finger, uh, my pointy finger, um, start from the jugulum where the sternum ends, and then go up, up, up until I find something hard. The first notch here, that would be the cricoid, um, the cricoid cartilage, and just about that I will find that. The reason why I'm going into uh, just about that I will I will find the the area where I have to cut. The reason why I'm going into details about this is like this sensation um, is this will probably be be a blind um, blind maneuver to do. There will be a lot of blood, and sometimes the neck will be really big and floppy, and you won't be able to see anything. So you do this blindly. And that's why this prominence, the first prominence, is important to notice you, because you already had your hand here. That's not it. Um, so you go up, 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 and then, oh, the first one. That's it. Okay, then you, then there's the uh, how you hold your scalpel, cut like a surgeon. You don't use a pencil grip, you use a um, overhand grip on the, on, the, um, on the knife. And there's a lot of things about what kind of knife you should use, and you use the knife that is available to you, I would say. But if you have, I think it's a, 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 a number, I think it's 10 or 11 that you, they, they, they recommend. Then you use, then you first do a big, big eight centimeters vertical decision, uh, in, incision. So eight centimeters is usually an adult male's middle finger. That's kind of the size. So that's the size you want to uh, cut vertically. And then horizontally you will do your, when you find the area, then you'll stab down and then you'll cut first to the right side and then you'll move around and, and move the blade 180 degrees and cut the other way around. And you then you'll um, then you'll um, get the knife into this into the side with the with the knife's edge um, uh, being towards the patient's uh, feet. And here you will hold the knife. You will always from now on have something in the hole. And this is where I will usually push my um, my um, second finger um, still my first and third finger are holding the cartilage here and i'll then put my um, examining finger into the hole being careful not to cut myself and this is especially pre-hospitally important because it's it will be dark and you won't be able to see anything and this is a blind maneuver in general so this is why you all you we want to use the finger um, in the hole because the next step will be be um, more successful probably if you have the finger in your hole in the hole because next step is bushy. If you have your finger in your hole, your nail facing this way and your um, the the bulb of your finger facing facing towards the patient's head, then you will with your bushy go in from from the patient's feet and then in here and then um, touch your um, the bulb of your finger. Because then you will have the sensation of it going into the the airway. One of the main reasons why people fail airways is because they uh, dissect into the um, into the tissue instead of into the airway, and then blow up the tissue and create emphysema. So, so you want to make be hundred percent sure that the bushy is going in, and that would be with the finger. The risk is that you might cut yourself, but if you have the blade facing towards the patient's feet, then it's, there's a, a minor risk. Okay, put the bushy in and load load the bushy with the uh, tube. The tube should be a size 6 tube. And then you just keep, always keep something in the hole, always hold the bushy, and then you, with your assistant, um, get the get the bushy in, maybe you have to, uh, sorry, get the uh, tube in, maybe you have to twist it a bit, and uh, rotate uh, rotate a bit and when it's just in the cuff just has to be right in not 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 long in but just a little bit in then you blow it up uh, with a um, syringe and then uh, it's all done so you see what you need for this isn't that much in the in the phone kits there's a lot of stuff what you actually need is a knife you need your bushy you need a size 6 tube and a syringe for for cuffing 
And then when uh, all, everything is done, then you'll use your uh, Rubens uh, or your BVM to uh, insulate the patient. Sometimes you'll need suction and compressors afterwards. Yeah. If you want to look see more about this, then I have a lot of links on my um, on our blog. Scott Weingar has, has done a lot of a lot in this area. Um, there are videos on his page and also of a live uh, 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 like a live Kaiko um, event, um, and he has a smack talk about this as well. How do you practice this? Then? Well. You can practice it by printing out one of these. This is a um, this is a, a 3D printout which can be um, found um, on the internet pretty pretty easily. Um, there's got something called the Airway app as well, which can and you they, you can 3D print this out, and then in any in any area where you can 3D print, then. To make it more realistic, I, I got this tips for, these tips from Clara Sundberg Lind. So um, thank you so much for that. Um, you will use gaffer tape, and, and the reason why I'm I'm really glad for, for uh, because she has done a few of these. I'm I'm sure uh, as an ENT, and so she knows how it should feel. And so the way she did hers were gaffer tape, then. Um, um, then menstrual pads around, and then one of the, some of this hospital tape, and then you'll just tape this uh, device to the mannequin. Then you have a pretty life-sized, pretty lively, uh, or pretty real um, airway. So here, we ha you ha here you have another picture of it: layer one, layer two, layer three, and then okay. In the next. Um, episode uh, of this uh, series, we'll we'll go through um, the advanced um, the advanced airway and how to do um, rapid sequence intubation or induction, depending on which um, terminology you like. Okay.